Welcome to SCOTUScast, a project of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. Our contributors join us from around the country to bring you expert commentary on U.S. Supreme Court cases as they are argued and decisions are issued. The Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Thank you for joining us for this post-decision episode of SCOTUScast. I'm your host, Grace Gotchling. On July 6, 2020, the U.S. Supreme Court released its decision in Bar v. American Association of Political Consultants, Incorporated, a case involving a dispute over whether the government debt exception to the Telephone Consumer Protection Act of 1991's automated call restriction violates the First Amendment, and whether the proper remedy for any constitutional violation is to sever the exception from the remainder of the statute. In an opinion by Justice Kavanaugh, the court affirmed the case, holding that the exception for calls to collect government debt from a federal ban on robocalls to cell phones violates the First Amendment, but the exception is severable from the rest of the Telephone Consumer Protection Act of 1991. Justice Thomas joined the court's opinion as to Parts 1 and 2. Justice Sotomayor filed an opinion concurring in the judgment. Justice Breyer filed an opinion concurring in the judgment with respect to severability and dissenting in part, in which Justice Ginsburg and Kagan joined. Justice Gorsuch filed an opinion concurring in the judgment in part and dissenting in part, in which Justice Thomas joined as to part two. And now, to discuss the case, we have Michael Domino, professor of law at Widener University School of Law. A pleasure to discuss the case and to participate in this forum. The case involves a limitation in telephone consumer protection law that, generally speaking, prohibits robocalls. It prohibits uh, recorded, computerized messages, automatic dialing to uh, cell phones with a couple of exceptions. Most of those exceptions are not at issue in the case, but one recent one is. The law was originally passed in 1991, and In its first 25 years, it had exceptions for emergency calls and uh, where the recipient of the call had consented to receive the messages. A few years ago, 2015, however, Congress added a new exception, and it allowed robocalls where those calls were made solely for the purpose of collecting on a government-provided debt or government-backed debt. So if you took a loan from the government or if the government was was ultimately behind your loan, maybe you had a mortgage, you thought it was through a private company, or you had a student loan, you thought it was through a private company, but it's ultimately backed by the government, it was okay under this amendment to the law for a robocall to call you to remind you to pay your loan. The people who are challenging this law objected to that 2015 amendment. They are the Association of American Political Consultants. They are a group of political consultants, strategists, pollsters, and the like. They wanted to make robocalls for political purposes, survey people or or whatever else. Um, There's no question, no question at all that their their, uh, speech was political and therefore within the core of the First Amendment's protection, but it was nonetheless prohibited by this amendment to the statute because it wasn't an emergency call, people hadn't consented in advance to receive it, and it was not a call made to collect on a government debt. So the association sued and said, we're being discriminated against. We should be able to make these calls. The law allows certain kinds of robocalls and disallows our calls because of a difference in the content of the calls. If we wanted to make a call that said, uh, please pay your debt, that call would be allowed. But since we want to make a call that says, who are you going to vote for in November, that's disallowed. And what the association said was that the First Amendment prohibits this kind of content-based discrimination, allowing some speech, disallowing other speech, 
because of differences in the content of the speech. That's the content-based discrimination, and as a general matter, that's unconstitutional. To be a little more specific, uh, the court had held, has held for quite a long time, about half a century, that uh, content-based distinctions for laws regulating speech trigger strict scrutiny. And as you'll remember from constitutional law, strict scrutiny requires that the government have a compelling interest and adopt a law that is narrowly tailored to the achievement of that interest. That's a very high standard, very difficult for the government to meet. And it should be. The government's ability to privilege certain speech with certain content and ban other speech with other content is a very big threat to First Amendment values. And so the, the Supreme Court has said in case after case over this uh, very long time that if the government is going to do that, then it should have to uh, demonstrate a real necessity for doing it. And the association said, well, the government can't satisfy that standard here. And so this, this content-based discrimination is unconstitutional. The government should not be able to stop us from making robocalls because we are not going to say the approved messages. So what did the, the Supreme Court say when they got the case? The plurality opinion by Justice Kavanaugh uh, agreed with that part of the, the challenger's argument. Uh, but not with not with all of it, and they, uh, the plurality did not give the challengers the remedy they wanted. So the first thing I'm going to talk about in terms of the court's conclusion is the standard of scrutiny that the court adopted, and then I'm going to talk about the the court's final conclusion about whether the uh, whether there was a First Amendment violation or not, and then I'm going to talk about the remedy. So the first question, what well, standard of scrutiny applies? As I said, the, the court has applied strict scrutiny to content-based discriminations uh, in many cases in the past. The plurality says that strict scrutiny is appropriate here. But, but the court was 5-4 on this point. Somewhat surprisingly, uh, only the so-called conservatives on the court, Kavanaugh wrote the plurality opinion, and uh, Roberts, Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch also agreed that strict scrutiny was applicable to evaluate this content-based distinction. The other four justices, the so-called liberals, concluded that an intermediate scrutiny should apply. The lead opinion on this point was written by Justice Breyer, and he said that it's, we should not apply strict scrutiny reflexively to all content-based discrimination on speech or all content-based distinctions with regard to speech. And he said, uh, consistent with his uh, general jurisprudential philosophy and consistent with the major precedent in this case, which is a case called Reed versus Town of Gilbert, Breyer said, we should look at First Amendment values. What's the First Amendment generally trying to to do, trying to protect, and we should see whether this law jeopardizes those values. To put that in more concrete terms, what Justice Breyer said is that the First Amendment is designed to make sure that the government doesn't manipulate the marketplace of ideas, that it's not trying to suppress certain kinds of ideas, certain kinds of ideologies, not trying to control political debate, or that sort of thing. And he said, if that's what the government's trying to do, then by all means, apply strict scrutiny and apply a presumption that the government's regulation of speech is unconstitutional. But, he said, where that seems implausible, where the government's rationale seems far more neutral, in this kind of case, he said, where the government seems more to be regulating commercial conduct, debt collection, rather than regulating speech for its communicative value, then that presumption of unconstitutionality is out of place. And he said here, there's no reason to think that the exception that Congress wrote into this law for, for uh, government debt collection, there's no reason to think that that was an attempt to manipulate politics or manipulate the marketplace of ideas or anything like that. And so he says, even though this law is content-based and even though it does regulate speech, we should apply intermediate scrutiny. 
That would be, uh, if it were adopted by the court, that would be a rather significant change from current doctrine. Uh, the court was uh, has generally applied strict scrutiny to all content-based distinctions on speech. And the Reed case from a few terms ago is the, the clearest expression of that, but by no means is it the only one. Uh, and his approach would give a, a very large amount of discretion to the courts to try to figure out whether the government was regulating speech for a good purpose or a bad purpose, for a speech restrictive purpose or a commercial regulatory purpose, or however the test uh, would have shaken out over succeeding cases. But uh, there were only four votes for that. The majority stuck with the the pre-existing law and said that strict scrutiny applies to content-based restrictions on speech. So that part of the decision was was five to four. Then the next step then is to figure out, well, uh, applying that standard is the content-based distinction in this law. The exception for collection on a government debt is that constitutional. And by a six to three vote, the court concluded that it was not constitutional. All five justices who applied strict scrutiny held that strict scrutiny was not satisfied here. The government did not have a compelling interest in prohibiting all robocalls except for the collection of government debt. Uh, And that was a pretty easy case. In fact, the government conceded that if strict scrutiny applied, that, that it did not meet strict scrutiny. The sixth vote was from Justice Sotomayor, who said that She agreed with Justice Breyer that intermediate scrutiny should apply, but the government didn't meet the standard of intermediate scrutiny either, that the government didn't have uh, much of an interest at all in favoring the collection of government debt and favoring calls about the collection of government debt as opposed to the challenger's political speech. And so she also concluded that that the restriction was unconstitutional. This content-based restriction on speech was unconstitutional. The, the other three, Justice Breyer, joined by Justice Ginsburg and Justice Kagan, they concluded that intermediate scrutiny should apply and the intermediate scrutiny standard was met, that the, that the collection of, of government debt was sufficiently different from any kind of concern about the suppression of speech and the interest in protecting the public from harassing robocalls was sufficiently important to meet the standard of intermediate scrutiny. So on the question of whether the exception for robocalls about collecting government debt was constitutional, the court says it's not by a vote of six to three. The final question was what to do about it. And this is a a, a tricky kind of problem because there are two ways to go with this once you conclude that the exception is unconstitutional. What the challengers wanted was an injunction prohibiting the government from enforcing the robocall ban against them. And that, um, so that would have given them what they wanted. It would have opened up this speech. It would have said that these people can't be, uh, can't have their speech penalized by a content-based distinction. And so we're invalidating the content-based distinction and letting them speak. The problem with that is that we could also treat their speech the same as everybody else's. That is, we could get rid of the content-based distinction by getting rid of the exception for the collection of government debt. That is, if we just banned robocalls across the board, we wouldn't be making any content-based distinction. The constitutional problem would be solved. We'd be returning the law to the form that it had prior to the 2015 amendment. So for the previous 25 years, this is what the law did. It pretty much flatly banned robocalls. We'd just be bringing it back to that. There would be no content-based distinction. The constitutional problem would be solved. But the challengers said... Well, that's not fair to us. Why would we or someone in our position go through all the trouble of bringing this case, challenging a content-based distinction, if at the end you're going to impose a remedy that does nothing for us? It doesn't let us make the speech that we want. Sure, it treats us the same as everybody else now by getting rid of somebody else's exception. But it doesn't give us what we want. There'd be no way that we would invest the time or resources to bring this challenge if we ended up winning and not doing uh, and not getting what we wanted. So it's it's the ultimate kind of uh, good news, bad news situation when the 
when you, you look at this from the perspective of the political consultants, so the good news is that the court agreed with you that the law was unconstitutional. Uh, bad news is that you still can't speak because the remedy was simply to ban robocalls across the board. So how does the court come out on this question? Should we uh, open up the speech? Should we uh, enjoin the operation of the statute, or should we eliminate the exception? And by a seven to two vote in this matter, the court severed the unconstitutional exception and applied the robocall ban across the board. And this is what uh, how the case was reported in the news. The, the 45 second summary of the case is that the Supreme Court upholds the ban on robocalls, even though the exception discriminated against certain kinds of speech based on content, the ban persists because the court was willing to say that we can solve the ban by, or solve the unconstitutional problem by just applying the robocall ban without regard to content and applying it to everyone. So the vote on that, as I say, seven to two, the plurality, Kavanaugh joined by uh, Roberts and uh, Alito on this point, they concluded that the it was, the proper remedy was to sever the unconstitutional exception. And they were joined in this conclusion by the four liberals, Breyer, Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan. That makes up the seven justice majority in favor of, of severing the unconstitutional part. Thomas and Gorsuch were on the other side, and they said that this statute is unconstitutional because it makes a content-based distinction that cannot satisfy strict scrutiny, and that the proper remedy for that is to give the speakers an injunction. And if Congress wants to wants to rewrite the statute and apply a robocall ban across the board, well, then Congress can do that later. The response of the plurality to the Gorsuch opinion was that, that in the short term, at least, that would produce a political result that, n that nobody, or at least nobody in Congress, wanted. That if the Gorsuch opinion won, then robocalls would be allowed. The overall ban on robocalls would have been struck down, and robocalls could have been used until Congress passed a new statute. Uh, in the short term, that would have been very unpopular. Most people don't like receiving robocalls. And it seems reasonably clear, at least it was clear to the plurality, that if Congress had to choose between not having any robocall ban at all and having one that applied across the board, that they would choose the one that applied across the board. They would have the, the robocall ban that they had in place for 25 years before that, that banned all robocalls except for the uh, emergency calls and calls that the recipient had consented to receive. Um, so the court says, let's go back to let's go back to that rule. That was fine for everybody. That didn't create a content-based distinction. People were happy because robocalls were banned, and there's no First Amendment problem because we're not discriminating against certain kinds of speech based on its content. Thank you for listening to this episode of SCOTUScast. SCOTUScast is a project of the Federalist Society, a not-for-profit educational organization of conservative and libertarian law students, law professors, and lawyers, founded upon the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast series, including SCOTUScast and Practice Group Podcasts, on iTunes or Google Play. For an archive of past podcasts, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at fedsoc.org slash multimedia. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash multimedia. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 